Imagine. That's where it all started, really. Imagine if I could build the helicopter I'd always wanted. It's a simple enough idea, but where do you start with something like that? I don't remember exactly when it was that the idea of making a helicopter really took hold of me. I can't ever really remember not having this sort of deep burning desire inside to build this helicopter. I looked a, young, a lot younger 40 years ago. My dad looks just like me. I, re I remember the day when I was sort of seven or eight and I went around to Jace's house and his bedroom was covered in pictures of dashboards for cars and helicopters. He's always been very driven. Um, if he wasn't good at something, He'd put 120% in and make himself good at it. And I think he's, he was willing to step into the unknown, and I think most people are not, not really comfortable with that. No matter how hard I tried to convince myself, I could never crush this idea inside me. I could never get this thought out of my head that I had to build this, this helicopter. Just looking every day at solving the next problem, and the next problem, and the next problem, and then before you know where you are, you've solved a lot of problems, and you're halfway there. Here we had an industry that had been stagnant and devoid of innovation for 40 years. People were just disinterested. There was nothing to buy that made flying exciting. I got introduced to the HX-50 and it just, it, it breathed new life into my career and what I wanted to do with it. They've taken the greatest hits of everything that works in helicopters and they put it into one machine. And that machine is going to change the game. We had to do it better, and it's that simple idea that defined HX50 and defined Hill itself. When you boil all of this stuff down to exactly what's required from an engineering point of view and from a business point of view, the whole thing is just a massive undertaking. Not only is he passionate and wild and got crazy ideas, but he has an understanding of nature, an understanding of our universe, and an understanding of engineering that allows him to navigate past blockages that most people just couldn't get close to. And he will not compromise. I'm so proud of the team. Um, what they've done over these last four months, put all the hours in, effort in. If you have the levels of dedication and expertise that I see within this team that we've got here, um, it's good to be part of that team and you realise that that challenge is surmountable. The people had spent years articulating what was wrong with light aircraft and what they wanted and had just been ignored. We listened and we were ready to deliver exactly what people wanted. Hill delivers a symphony of innovation to the helicopter industry. 2018, when Jason showed me those first drawings of the HS50, I thought, this is going to be a dream to fly. But now, he did it and he's just started a revolution of general aviation as a whole. Imagine, 30 years ago, a boy dreamed about building a helicopter, more beautiful, more capable and attainable than ever before. That boy's dream became the life's work of a young man and now a middle-aged man. A task so massive and so ambitious that it took a team of the most brilliant minds over a decade to engineer and push them far beyond what they thought they ever dreamed was possible. But if you believe, and if you have the courage to build on your dreams and drive them into vivid reality, then one day, the day comes, and your dreams have been built. GA 2.0 is here. This is HX50.
Duxford. Good you evening, go. ladies and gentlemen. There, there we go. go. We've got a mic. Woo! Yes! Got a get a mic! Woo! <laughs> uh, Nothing's stopping us. Get a mic! Jason, the helicopter is so good that we had to show them twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, HX50. Uh, yes! There's always problems with prototypes. I didn't expect it to be the mics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to go straight into it tonight. We've got uh, two HX50s here for you, one on wheels, one on skids. We're going to give you a tour of the whole thing, and then I'm going to get out of the way, and you can come and have a play. So let's get straight into it. Um, we promised you a proper helicopter, a helicopter with standing, with posture, a helicopter that when you turn up at the hotel or the golf club, uh, the guys that see you arrive think, who is that? <laughs> and their wife thinks, who is he? <laughs> and their kids think, I want to be just like him. And <laughs> this is what we set out to do. So this is HX50. Um, one of the, uh, the key uh, design inspirations for this, one of the key design drivers, was trying to bring general aviation back up to uh, the level of design quality, the level of design standards that we're all akin to in the automotive industry and every other area of our life. So as you go and you get close and you experience the machine, you'll find that we've got A-class surfaces everywhere, automotive levels of design uh, in terms of the surfaces and the, the detail that go in there. We've made a, uh, a proper helicopter. In terms of the operational aspects, we wanted this to feel like a magic carpet ride. So we've bedecked the thing with glazing. Everybody, no matter where you sit in this helicopter, has an amazing view. The glazing is all flush fitted with the, the fuselage. You'll find that exterior A surface is completely uninterrupted for the lowest possible aerodynamic drag. It's a thing of beauty. Um, Jason, it, is that a proper helicopter? It is a proper helicopter. You know, when I stood up next to this thing and I started looking at it, you know, when you're young, you have dreams of flying proper helicopters. Yeah, yeah. And all my life, you know, there's been certain aircrafts that's like, yeah, that's, that's the goal. And you stand up next to this thing, and it just kind of puts those in the shadows a little bit. This is a proper helicopter. It feels substantial. It feels safe. You know, when I look up there, we're going to talk about all the different parts. But, you know, that's, I, I want to get inside this and fly it. Yeah, well, you won't have to wait. <laughs> you won't have to wait too long. And the volume, so, right? The volume is yeah. amazing. You know, the first time we saw this was that we knew it was going to be comfort and just a big presence. But once you look at it in life, it just, it's a big thing. You know, it's, it's a yeah. big volume. It's a proper and helicopter. It's a proper helicopter, exactly. It's a proper helicopter. Right, so let's start at the, at the front. So one of the key design cues down here, we wanted the whole thing to have all of the features that, that top automotive uh, products have. So you'll find at the nose of the helicopter, we've kept this under wraps for, for quite a long time, we present a 3D form of the, the heel badge, the butterfly wings, right there at the front of everyone. It's our version of Rolls-Royce's Spirit of Ecstasy. Um, we have an automotive uh, cluster at the bottom, the front half of your anti-collision strobe is down there with the uh, upper, the short and long focus landing lights back there. Um, when, we, when we designed the, the surfaces of HX50, excuse me, when we designed the surfaces of HX50, this feature that runs all the way along the length of the uh, airframe was a key styling feature. And we've accentuated that by building in this chrome strip that runs all the way from the chin windows through to the, the back. So the bright wear that you'd come to expect. This looks nice, Jason. Yeah, <laughs> the That's bright wear really that nice. you'd come to expect on a, on a premium automotive uh, program, uh, product. And then, of course, we've ex uh, accentuated that with the, the animated light strips as well. We've got to make flying cool again. And that's what this is, this is all about. You know, this, this reminds me, when you walk up to it, the, the helicopter is almost alive. Like, it's almost your friend, and, and it wants to greet you. Yeah, it will. So when you, when you unlock the, the central locking, the helicopter will wake up. Yep. The, the interior lights will, will fade in. Okay. The, uh, the, nav uh, the nav stripes, the signature stripes will come to life. And it'll say to a hello to you every time you want to go out and play. It says, where are we going today? <laughs> you know what it reminds me? There's two versions here, right? We're going to talk about that. Yeah. For me, this is the dolphin, and that one is the shark. <laughs> yeah, right? that one's fierce. Like, that's, a, that's a, an it's, aggressive look. It's aggressive. But this one is just elegant. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I'm undecided, although 
I don't want to lose the speed, so maybe yeah, I'll go. Well, with the this, this is the proper helicopter. That's the one for people that struggle to land. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what, though, Jason? I'm looking at these skids. You're never going to roll this helicopter over, eh? <laughs> I right, mean, that, I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm going to talk, before we get too silly, I'm going to talk about some uh, vaguely technical things. So not all of this is, is theater and pantomime. Um, you'll remember, well, the people that have been with us for the longest will remember that some of the very early presentations I explained that um, the forward flight speed of helicopters isn't, uh, for, for operational speed ranges, isn't limited by advancing uh, tip Mach numbers and retreating blade stall. It's actually that they're just really draggy. So one of the things that has been a key design philosophy all the way through the program is retractable undercarriage to get those out of the way, cowl in the main rotor pylon, get that out of the wind. So when you look at that, that beautiful piece of sculpture on the top of the, the airframe, that's, that's not artistry. That is essentially an aerofoil profile, if you were to cut it in section, into which we've sculpted in the inlets for the engine and the exhaust to get the, the air through the system. So that really is one of the fundamental things that drives the, the forward flight performance of HX50. The same with the, the, the donut, as we call it, on the top. Getting the, the mechanics of the rotor system, you can see the rotor system over there. It's just as big and ugly as every uh, conventional three-bladed rotor system you'll find. But we've managed to tuck that away with elegantly fed in blade roots and then get all of the, manacle, uh, the mechanical stuff out of the wind and took safely away so we can get the drag down. And just to give you a, a historical example of why this is important, back in, I think it was either late 50s or early 60s, probably the early 60s, um, they did a program of development, the US Army did a program of development on the Huey. And just by fairing in the enormous mast and pylon that that aircraft has, fairing in the, uh, the skids, they managed to get the cruise speed of that aircraft up to 140 knots. So getting on top of it's the drag is for a Huey. really, really important. Uh, you know what I'm just important. remembering, Jace? Yeah. Five years ago, when we met you for the first time in Spain, yeah. you showed us some very low-res renders, some drawings of this helicopter. And I thought, wow, that looks really cool. And, uh, and the hub, the, the donut, looked exactly like this. And I thought to myself, huh, I wonder, when he's, gonna, that. I wonder when he's gonna get to the detail of you know, designing the rotor head and what the rotor head's actually gonna look like in real life. And it's crazy five years later that it looks exactly like those original drawings. We're gonna look uh, in a little bit of what it looks like underneath so you can see the mechanics of it, but incredible to see it go from those early, early renders to real life. Yeah, and, and not lose that. Finesse. No, the, the the key the key characteristics of the the aircraft have to have to stay the way they were always envisaged, otherwise it, it loses the essence of what it is. Yeah. Now, there's a million things on this aircraft that we've pushed and pulled and changed and revised, and there's there's still a bunch of that to go on yet. Yeah. Um, but it will always be this. Yeah. It will always be HX50. It will always it will always have this uh, this impact. What is That's special about the what is, what, is, what is special about the shape the shape of the heli? What do you have here? It's, in so it, 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 it's been beautifully sculpted by Henry Morshead, our chief designer, but fundamentally, it's a tadpole with a long tail. So <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a teardrop that uh, pushes through the air gently and then allows the air to collect smoothly behind it as it passes through. The least disturbance you can, uh, you can create in the air. We're trying to keep the flow attached all the way over the body, which we do. Uh, and that's the, that's the secret to, to low drag and high forward, uh, forward performance. Let's talk about the rotor blades for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, a, lot of, a lot of existing helicopters are, are, are quite old designs, uh, and so they use uh, old aerofoil sections, old platform designs. Um, we've been able to essentially bring uh, GA helicopters right up to date. The big stuff is different, uh, but GA helicopters have lagged behind. So Is that uh, why, because you're using composites instead of metals? Co composites so you're is, able a, to composites better? is a really, really important important ingredient yeah. uh, because it allows us to evolve the cross-sectional profile down the length of the blade. Yeah. So we use modern aerofoil profiles. We can choose the, the twist distribution for optimal performance. And then, of course, out at the tips here, we've got parabolic tips that help us uh, improve forward flight speed uh, and also keep the noise it as low noise, as possible. It? Yeah, yeah, it really affects the You don't the, get that noise. Slap, and, slapping, and the tip right? cap and yeah. the tip cap geometry as well. Okay. So sophisticated modern rotor blades. Yeah. But that stuff, the, there are other helicopters that have that level of technology. But the thing for me that we're, we're most proud of is just how well we've got that fared into the, the main rotor. Yeah, tell me about that. Um, how does that work? Because so it, it looks like magic to me. It is, is there magic. black magic it is going magic. on there? Yeah, it is magic. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about the rotor head itself over there a little bit later. But I'm thinking but, about the way the blade attaches to the... Yeah, the exactly. Group. So it's, it's essentially a slightly newer take on a very old way of doing it. 
Yeah. And so we've got two pins out there that transfer the lag motion into the cuff and into the lag damper. And those two flaps that you can see at the root of the blade are essentially, essentially your blade fold mechanism. You know, I was really surprised. Yeah. I saw these things being installed, and they were quick. I mean, they yeah. were simple. Yeah. It was I just said, you should have seen it the first time we did it. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, it's just uh, two pins and those yeah. clips. And it's secure, but it's so simple. Yeah. yeah. So with, with helicopters, th this looks like a, a spaceship, right? But underneath it, it's quite simple. You know, there's a, there's a lot of really sophisticated design work gone into making a simple structure, a simple mechanical layout, and simple implementation to the blades. And that's how we will get to, to get the levels of reliability out of it that we need for, for long, long life and, and reliability in service. So you're saying this is a proven design, the way that you've uh, designed these? Yeah, don't, don't, don't forget out. what we've said all along. Uh, this is a greatest hits album. Yeah. It's all the things that we know and love from uh, the helicopter industry, proven concepts uh, packaged beautifully and delivered using our vertical integration strategy for manufacturing. We can control the costs end-to-end -end of absolutely everything. So that, that's the key to all of this. Okay. So well, let's just have a, a bit of a, a walk around the exterior, because uh, yeah. I know you're going to be excited to, to get into the, the inside. Now, Jason, so, there's, there's two parts of my, the helicopter that are, I think, rising to the top for my favorites, yeah. just in design and the way that it feels. One of them is the, the hub, so the, the main rotor hub. It just feels so substantial, yeah. especially when you're flying in turbulence, which is, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk more we'll about that later that. maybe. Um, and this horizontal stabilizer. Yeah. It's so a work of art. It's incredible. The, the, the stabilizer is beautiful. The, the importance of having uh, a big horizontal stabilizer is quite simple. To get a good forward flight speed, you have to be able to keep the fuselage level right. in forward flight. So we've inclined the mast forward quite substantially, uh, and then uh, we've got a, a very high authority horizontal stabilizer to keep the ship level. Yeah. Is so, there a reason why it's away from the, the tail like this? Yeah, again, that's, that's about uh, aerodynamics and drag. Yeah. Because we keep the flow attached from the, the front all the way to the back, we get a relatively thick boundary layer building up as we go from front to back of the aircraft. Uh -huh. So if you the boundary layer, think of your hand, dip it in a bu bucket of water, pull your hand out, your hand's still wet. Yeah. Right? That's because fluids are sticky. Air sticks to this, right. and we build up an air, a, a thin layer where the, the helicopter's dragging the air along with it. That's the boundary layer, and that dominates a lot of the aerodynamic performance. Right. So as we get this thick boundary layer building up, we don't want that contaminating the leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer, ah. tripping the flow around there, and driving the performance of this. So we put fences there to keep that separate. Nice. And so it also that, looks that's beautiful. what those are there for. The, the end plates on the horizontal stabilizer, again, these are relatively large. And this is all to do with in autorotative descents or in high rates of descents, maintaining high levels of your stability right. uh, and your authority. Similarly, mm -hmm. the reason for the, the large fin is because uh, enclosed tail rotors have slightly different characteristics to open tail rotors, and again, in high power, high speed climbs, we want to make sure we've got lots of anti-torque authority from the fin so that we can offload the rotor and keep the most amount of power available for the main rotor. What about linearized uh, like the fan here? Like yeah, the so the, 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 beauty, the beauty of ducted fans, of course, is that they, they're a lot quieter, uh, they're a lot safer, it's much harder to stick this into something hard, that's yeah. going to send you spinning around. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you are, could try, but it would be pretty hard <laughs> to get your head in here. Here, I think, right? <laughs> you find me the person that didn't turn my mic on. We'll <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. So, uh, with the tail rotor itself, we've got a large cord blade here, so we've got lots of authority. People like what kind of authority are we talking? Because I know that. One of the common questions is, yeah, shrouded tail rotors, they can lack in authority. No. What are so we talking about this, as far as what can we do with this? This has been designed to be able to maintain directional control at 35 knots from any direction at max gross weight at 10,000 feet on an ISA plus 15 day. So you're hovering out of ground effect at 10,000 feet, winds blowing from any side or the back? This will keep you pointed in the right direction. Wow. Who will fly in that, those yeah. conditions? I mean, that's, that's <laughs> limit. Yeah. Uh, that's I can't impressive. wait. Yeah. Now, if you happen to be unfortunate and yeah. uh, mm. for whatever reason stick the tail into the ground, what you can see down here is we've got a frangible tail bumper here. Frangible. So this is, this is a, a part that's designed to protect the integrity of the important bits here yeah. uh, and is easily and, and inexpensively uh, replaced. So, so you can replace this. 
Yeah, and if you bump it and damage it, you just replace that okay. bit. Awesome. Um, so we're not going to get a little stinger at the bottom like we see with most helicopters. This is uh, the uh, replacement for the stinger. Uh, that should be that should be enough, yeah. But yeah, let's let's wait let's wait and see in test flying how uh, how easy <laughs> so it is to stick the tail in. <laughs> so if we work our way around to the other side of the aircraft again, we can present now the uh, the tail light. Every single light cluster on the the aircraft is intended to be a, a little piece of jewelry, something that right. sets the the elegance of the the machine apart from from other aircraft, bringing general aviation up to, to automotive standards. So we've got some brightware in there, we've got the, uh, the LED clusters, uh, and so that's the back half of your anti-collision light and also your rear position lights. One thing I've noticed in these lights, they're yeah. beautiful on and they're beautiful off. Yes. You know, there's so much detail. Design and detail. You get a lot of thought to this because general light is just a light, right? Like a functional light, but you thought way beyond that. What was the reason for that? <laughs> I, I, uh, the whole design objective for this is to make people want to go flying again. Mm -hmm. We've got to make people want to learn to fly. And these are people that are, that are used to the finest supercars, the finest cars in all the world. Uh, and we need to give them a reason to, to start flying again. And, and it's the little bits of jewelry that, that make that so. If we just talk about the lights for a, a second. Can we talk about them on this one? Yeah. yeah. We yeah, haven't, cool. uh, I don't we like haven't this one. Shark. Got, I don't the like this shark. one. It's got skids. It's he doesn't like this one. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to worm you he up. He doesn't like skids here, Jason. Why don't we talk yeah. about this light over here? Yeah. So what we've, what we've got in the, the, the lighting system on HX50, you've got uh, conventional uh, navigation lights, so you've got a, a simple LED cluster at the tip of each wingtip and your white lights in the tail. Your anti-collision light is split between front and back to make sure we cover the full 360 range that you're required to. Yeah. You've also then got landing lights, so the nose cluster has the short focus and long focus narrow beam that uh, illuminates where you're going, whereas the, the side pods here give you a broader view of what's around you for when you're uh, going into to more confined areas. And then as part of the, the signature lighting, we've got the lighting stripe that runs down the side that delivers some of the navigation light uh, functionality, but with a bit of panache. <laughs> uh, and then we've also got the, the tips in the wing tip clusters. And that's really just about giving the aircraft a signature when it's on the ground. This is going to be uh, the brightest in helicopter the in the sky. Yeah, it's a Christmas tree of a helicopter. <laughs> So let's talk about okay. the undercarriage for a, a minute before. Oh, undercarriage. Uh, let's go back this way. I like that. Hey. Are we talking about so, undercarriage? We're talking about uh, cargo hooks, right? No. <laughs> yeah. So where's, where's the cargo hook on this? If thing, you can Dave? find it, you can have it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. OK, right. so uh, from, from my point of view, generally, I'll stand over here so people can see. <laughs> from my point of view uh, in general aviation, you've got to try and make the whole experience of flying as easy as possible. So when the helicopter's in the air, that's great. But once you're on the ground, you really need to be able to move these things around conveniently and effortlessly. So the wheel under carriage makes that a lot easier than the dolly wheels and the wheelbarrow thing that you have to this do with the skidded sales pitch helicopter. For the, skidded yeah? or the wheeled version. And, and obviously, one of the options that you can uh, select for the wheeled version version of HX50 is Helimove, which gives you the ability to drive this thing electrically on the ground via your smartphone or the, uh, the puck to that. in the cabin. So it just means getting it out of the hangar and putting it away again and much simpler than it's ever been before. So you're so, saying I could sit inside the helicopter, press a button, hangar door is open, and I could drive it into the hangar from inside yeah. the helicopter? Yeah, that's the whole point. We've got to make it as easy as possible. With the puck or the app? Uh, either either. Probably the puck Next. when you're inside. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Let's talk, let's talk about the, uh, the special needs undercarriage. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's so, a affectionate name. We're calling it the shark. But obviously, uh, all, all, all intelligent story. people will be buying the wheels, but there are some people that <laughs> want to land belly deep in snow. Misha. Come on, you designed it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm putting the bear paws on yeah. mine. I'm going to have the wheels. So for, for the, in all seriousness, the uh, there are a handful of applications where you really do need ski at skids. Yeah. So if you're, if you're landing in really, really wet, muddy uh, fields, the skids are going to be a better, a better fit for you. Uh, if you're doing lots and lots of takeoffs and landings, so some of our tour operators, for example, skids are a better bet there just because it's less to go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're uh, operating in Canada, cold areas, lots of snow, 
uh, skids are a much better fit. You don't want to be packing the uh, undercarriage doors into yeah. hard snow. You'll, you'll soon ruin those. So the, there are applications where the skids are... So you're telling uh, me I need skids? No, Is you're not you're having skids. Is that what you're telling me, Jace? You're not having skids. <laughs> so again, if you look at the design of the, the skids, uh, we've got a fence on the, uh, the leading edge of the front. And again, that's just about keeping the flow attached to the fuselage. And it's about getting nice streamlined flow over the skid fairings. And unlike a lot of uh, traditional helicopters, when you come to the rear mounting point, the skids evolve organically out of the stub wings at the back of the helicopter. Yeah. You get the same lighting clusters on both helicopters, so you still get the distinctive HX50, uh, HX50 look, but you get that slightly wider uh, stance with the, um, uh, with the, with the skids. So, uh, yeah, all, all, good with, uh, all good with skids. Let's talk about the, the baggage bay. Baggage. So, We've, we've, brand, we've branded these helicopters as, say as, as aerial grand tours. Luggage? Baggage. baggage? Luggage? Luggage, baggage, whatever you what want to call it. What luggage is it? There, well. There's a luggage bay in this helicopter? <laughs> The whole point of this was we needed a proper baggage bay if this was a helicopter hey, you could uh, use Ruben, every day. Hey, I found some things back here. You, you're yeah. flying? Are so, you flying? You just flew in? I we found a backpack. Some there stuff is here. enough baggage okay. space in what? this helicopter What's for my wife. Backpack? Okay. Let me it demonstrate. Does. Okay, it does take a backpack, right? It takes Let a backpack. A backpack hey, is I enough. I need to put okay. my cards Stuff down here. A backpack is enough. <laughs> this, is no, Hill, no. this is Hill Classics. Who put this in here? <laughs> oh, something is there. All right. Does okay. anybody want a shirt? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have some other stuff here. Somebody wants a shirt? Okay. Is he never travels that line? All right. Okay, who wants a shirt? Baggage. So I'll take that. I've got another Jace, shirt. Who wants take another Take a baggage here. Right Let's over here. Let's One. And we've got a hat. Who wants a hat? Um... Misha, come yeah. and help us. I can help Baggage. you. Baggage. Yeah. One more hat. Two. There's you. Misha, come and help us. Hey, I got to help Baggage. you. Sorry. Baggage. Okay. Three. Baggage. Oh, okay. We got another one. Come on. I got I to gotta get some stuff out of this one. Come on. Jace, please. <laughs> it's a bit heavy, that one. Pelly case. Stuff Who traveled with the pelly case? All right. Yeah. I'm going on a business trip, and I'm going to do some, this presentation. I have some. Okay. <laughs> here you go. Let's put this, this one here. Okay. All right. I, uh, I think I'm going to go golfing, so I got to grab my golf bags. What a second. Okay. There's a little small one here. This isn't a trick, uh, by the way. This is kay. all in the. The other side is not open, by the way. Okay. Another one. Hey, another Jace, one. can I get your hand over here? Okay. <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to be able to hold the door on this one. And another one. There we go. You're still going over there? Huh. I That's thought you it. were done. And is he? Is that enough? A backpack. <laughs> Everything in there. So you can you can Are really we going snowboarding as well. <laughs> yeah, there you, go. you can really go places in this helicopter. Let's go and take a look inside. Let's go inside. We want to go. Okay, let's go inside. Ooh. Oh. So, another little piece of detail. Okay. Nice. Uh, helicopter door handles are often quite simple. They're often afterthoughts. They're often, thing, they're often things that have no uh, consideration to the experience. We've gone for the sort of flush fitting swandle door handle. So it pops proud, opens up, and away you go. So again, trying to give you that car-like feel. Um, and then one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we lived up to modern expectations for vehicles when you, when you enter the helicopter. So when you come and have a look inside, you'll find the doors are all properly trimmed with door cards. The gray areas, which are the, the, uh, the thresholds between the outside and the inside, uh, are all very well executed. And then if you just have a look at the door threshold down there, Rob, we've put uh, proper branded tread plates between the, the inside and the outside. That's Proper be good for those commercial operators, eh? Exactly, exactly. Well-fitting carpets, well-fitting carpet mats, everything that you'd expect from a, a really high-end uh, premium, uh, premium product. So again, when you come inside the, the helicopter, then what we're trying to create here is a cosseting uh, cabin environment that makes you feel secure. Uh, if you're trying to get people in from outside of aviation that are new to aviation, you don't want their first thought to be, oh, is this safe? 
<laughs> you know, you want the cabin to be reassuring. You want it to be car-like. If you look at the, the beams that we've got around the structure, they feel they're, substantial. Of, they're of familiar proportion. So the yeah. kinds of things that you, you'd expect. The whole cabin is trimmed in the finest uh, quality materials that are available, exactly what you would expect from, from a premium car. So you can see the, the roof cappings are all, uh, are all trimmed in leather. You've got the, 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 the nose pillar, the A pillar, the B pillar, all trimmed all the way down to the carpet threshold uh, at the base. And then the, the center console itself is again a very automotive design. It's all about creating a beautiful environment in which to, uh, to, go, to go flying. The other thing to, to note as well is, like I said, we want this to feel like a magic carpet ride. So I want everybody in the helicopter to have the best seat in the house. Mm. So each seat has an amazing view. I think this view. is the best seat in the house. That is the best seat in the house. I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. We've got roof lights throughout the roof of the, the helicopter so that it's a bright, airy, spacious, but still secure environment in which to, to go flying. So the whole thing has, uh, has come together. And of course, uh, one of the most important things um, given that a, a lot of helicopter seats are considered to be instruments of torture, <laughs> is to have proper seats. So this is the, uh, the HX-50 crew seat. It's the same seat in every position in the helicopter. Um, so it's, again, back to the original design intent. The, uh, the headrest just far enough back, so whether you wear a helmet or whether you're on a headset, it, it'll accommodate all of that. You have options for a three-point harness or the full five-point harness here. Uh, we present the, 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 uh, the seat in both perforated and uh, solid leather just to give it that sense of a, a jet fighter, that sense of aeronautical about it. Yeah. The, uh, the original design uh, had a provision for the headrests to be located on the, uh, on the back of the seat like so, so they're completely out of the way. Yeah. We'll use that extensively when you park the helicopter. The headrests will always be stowed in the, uh, the back of the cabin for, uh, for, for uh, when they're not being used. And then we've also provided for a headset hook uh, that's more convenient to get at. Just quicker for, and easier. Yeah, right? for, for, the, for the machines that are used regularly just by two pilots note. up front. Yep. So all of that sort of stuff uh, has, has come, together, come, come together beautifully. So let's talk about the, the flight environment for a, for a minute. Um, we have a characteristic gooseneck uh, cyclic, and the whole point of this is that the, the thing moves up and down, so you can move it out of the way to get in. So when you climb into the, uh, the helicopter, uh, yeah. it's really, really comfortable. You, you can the then drop the hop in, cyclic run. down. You're going to fly. Are we going to go uh, flying? <laughs> Not yet, but almost. Well, Drop the cyclic down so it's at a perfect height, no seat. matter what your size or build. Let me try this out. And then what we've got in front of, in front of us here uh, is an environment like no other for VFR flying. So even though we've got two 15.6-inch screens in front of us, yep. uh, you've still got an amazing down angle. I don't know about you, but I can see about a meter in front of the nose, Absolutely, half yeah. a meter to a meter in front of the nose. All the renders make it look like these are really big and they're right in your face. No, no, no. But they're, they kind of disappear. They just... They're, yeah, they're down low, they're back, nice, they're, yeah. perfect, uh, perfect position for they're them. They're much lower than they think they are. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you've got the backlit cyclic, back lit cyclic head. <laughs> so you've got your autopilot controls, autopilot off, your frequency pl uh, plus and minor and minus and your flip switch. Yep. The collective is fully integrated with the center console. I love now, that. we get lots of comments about the collective. Oh, where's my handbrake gone? <laughs> I'm not work at the whole idea is if you're going to have a center console in a helicopter, yeah. then your arm movement needs to be front and back. I otherwise, love that. You, otherwise, you can't use the, uh, the, the armrest. Yeah. So this thing, it's an entirely conventional action. It just moves forwards and backwards. Just, yeah. We've just moved that pivot point you forward. Know what, instead of power, what happens there? Like you, it's going to be just moving up and down? Yeah, so this is, this is, another, uh, this is another unique feature of, of HX50. Because every machine comes with a two-axis autopilot and uh, the haptic feedback on the controls, yeah. what you find if you look down here is both the cyclic and the collective mm -hmm. have triggers. Right. So the way this works is to move the, 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 the controls and to fly normally, you pull the triggers. Yeah. And then if we take it in terms of the collective, when you release the, the trigger, yeah. that collective is going to stay exactly where you put it. Beautiful. Now, Amazing. as standard, that's just a position, a, a a position hold function. Yeah. 
Um, when you've got the four axis autopilot, there's some other higher order modes that will manipulate the position of the collective to hold right. the, uh, the input target. So very, very conventional. In the, uh, in the wheeled version, obviously, the pedals also have uh, toe brakes as well, nice. so that you can independently brake the, the two rear wheels as well as your anti-torque uh, anti actions. Jason, um, this, this looks very modern. Is it a fly-by-wire system? Because no. it looks super modern. No. Or do we have uh, a more conventional system no, this that's is, this proven is, and tested? This is a completely conventional flight control system. So this like is that. a mechanical linkage. We have mechanical linkages under there in the, the center console. We use uh, push-pull cables that run all the way through the nose, yeah. uh, up the nose beam, and then up to the, the bell cranks in the Beautiful. roof. Uh, you pick up the hydraulic servos up there, and it's a conventional conventional simplex hydraulic system with manual reversion. Love it. Very, very conventional. This fancy looking cyclic just mechanically roots into the center of the panel there yep. and does normal cyclic functions down to a couple of bell cranks uh, and again up to the cables and through the nose. Now on these two helicopters, can we move the cyclics around or are they fixed because of the show? We no, don't for the show, these are, you can move them up and down just yep. to get in, but yep. that's locked. You can you can play with the, the collective and the full range, okay. but all the other flight controls yeah. are, are okay. locked. So for, you guys remember that? that later, eh? When you're hopping in the helicopter, let's not start playing around with that cyclic. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, we can we turn the lights on? Yeah, yeah. No, let's later. Let's. We don't want to do that now. No? No. Let's go flying, shall we? You want to go flying now? Yeah, let's go flying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the startup procedure in, uh, in HX50 is really, really simple. So you've got the start panel presented in the middle of the, uh, the cabin. You flick the power to, to on, and then when you flick the avionics on, the screens come to life. So we've got a, a simple boot up screen and then you'll be brought into a log on screen. Oh, Remember, user. we are yeah. trying to make general aviation as, easy, uh, as easily accessible and simple as it can possibly be. So behind the scenes, the system manages your log books, the aircraft's technical logs and all of that and that's all connected with the, the app. So you'll pre be presented with a log on, that can be a pin code log on or it will uh, coordinate with your app and your, okay. your profile on the app. Beautiful. So, we fire into uh, nice. normal operation and say hello to the, the new Digi cockpit. Beautiful. Okay. Wow. So uh, if we, we, we've also got the, the iPad again, obviously presenting the, the iPad uh, front and center in the cockpit. Yep. The guys like ForeFlight and the other app developers, Oz Runways, for example, do an amazing job yep. of collating all of the information you need for navigation, communication, weather, and all of that. There's no point us competing with that. Yep. Let those guys do what they're, they're good at. So we've, we've de elected to have provision for the biggest, that's the largest iPad you can buy. Love it. So the biggest uh, iPad right in the, the center of the, uh, the cockpit there. Um, and that this one's running for flight. So that automatically syncs with the onboard flight control computer. Okay. So the navigation mode from the autopilot will pull that route down from the from the iPad. So you could be sitting at home on your couch, you could be playing around on four flight, getting your route figured out, get all your details. You hop in here, plug it in, and it's sync synced it, to the aircraft. Sync it and, uh, and away you go. And away yeah, you go. It's, uh, Hit the autopilot it's, it's on after takeoff and, and away it goes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right, so let's have a, a talk through the, the Digi Cockpit for a second. This is yep. a new version of the digital cockpit. Uh, we've made a bunch of changes based on customer feedback. So one of the uh, one of the comments that You're we- You're over we, there, Jace. Yeah. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> one of the I'll just push that down. <laughs> one of the, uh, the the comments that we had from customers was that the the airspeed being at the lower at the bottom of the screen when the screens themselves were very low yep. uh, f f felt a, a, a little bit um, wrong. Mm -hmm. So we we flipped the arrangement of the digi cockpit around. We've now got the airspeed at the the, the top. I like of the display. it. It, it looks feels, like it's in the right spot. It feels like a, a head up di display. Yeah. Um, we've still got the the first limit indicator, uh, our sort of latest and greatest version of that. Yep. When you look at this, you've obviously got your uh, a percentage power range. Mm -hmm. You can pull 100% all day, every day. Yep. When you go into the uh, the five minute range, it will go orange and it will give you a five minute countdown. Yeah, right I saw on. that earlier. That yeah. was nice. When you, when you go into the red, it will do the same. So we can do five minutes uh, in the orange. Yeah. Nice. So it's designed for that twice every hour okay. as part of the mm. duty cycle for the for the engine. Okay. You've got an improved version of the engine and rotor RPM gauge out yeah, here I like on that the, the right hand side. Big, Simple, clear, clear. And for the rotor, you've got a nice big range of green. Yep. So that again, new pilots becoming familiar with auto rotation, it's easy for them to Very keep that in range. Very benign and auto rotation, and also uh, for like instructors, you know, because there's a big range there. Yeah. So it allows them to kind of watch it and uh, and see where it's going, and yeah, then. Yeah. 
uh, you know, jump in there if they need to, right? Exactly. Tell me about this panel here. And then if you, uh, one of the things that we've done to clean up the cockpit, a traditional helicopters had a stack of radios and transponders and audio panels and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Um, we've, we've combined all of those features into what we call the, the interactive pilot uh, interface. So basically everything that you need to input into the helicopter is available on the IPI. So if we start with radio nice. frequencies, this one's set up with two radios. So we've got two radios right so here. Yeah, you can click into your radio. It immediately so brings up the radio <laughs> like page. That. So again, just like you would with a phone or a web page, what we've got here is a, a page that details the nearest frequency. So that's just giving you the, the frequencies proximate to where your GPS position is. Yep. Uh, you've got a favorites page. So these are the ones if you're the things mm -hmm. like, for me, it'd be East Midlands Radar, Birmingham Radar, all the things around where we live. Yep. Uh, and then also recents. So the things that you use last, they're all there. They're all stored. Nice. And of course, you can just go over to a manual input page. You'll notice that some of the keys uh, are grayed out, yep. and it will only allow you to input valid inputs oh, nice. into uh, into the uh, into the, the setting. That's clever because so it's quicker to, to access that, yeah. right? Headsets, yeah. Okay, headsets in here. So can you work on this? you've also you've also got the uh, you've also got the the audio panel here. So we can pop the headsets on for a, a second if we just change from mic to the headset mics for a second. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Clear. Check, check. So yeah, again, gotcha. I, I don't know if, uh, if like me, you you uh, you travel with or you fly with noisy passengers. I, Sometimes I, I've never yeah, flown so with a noisy passenger. I, I fly with my my kids regularly, <laughs> and it's uh, it's torture. Though <laughs> one of the things that was high on my objectives for designing HX50 was making sure the functionality on the audio panel uh, was really easy to access. So what you can see at the top of the the IPI here is that you've got all of the uh, the crew isolation and the uh, pilot isolation features. Uh, available there. So uh, if you've got a noisy a noisy passenger, for example, yeah. let's try it. Ruben, why don't you tell us about that time you flew around the world? Oh man, it was amazing. So all I can Absolutely do now incredible. is just isolate me and you. <laughs> you can't hear him at all. He's uh, still talking. This, this guy will go on for hours yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard him talk about yeah. that world tour? That, that's why oh, we yeah, isolate yeah, him. I can't let's, believe it. Let's, let's invite him back in. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating, Ruben. Thank it you. Was yeah, very incredible. nice, Ruben. I so, was incredible. And you can obviously heard that story before. If you've got a whole family out with you, you can also just isolate the pilot as well. So. Okay. Misha, I mean, you could tell me all about your YouTube channel. Yeah, I mean, I could go on for hours about the I YouTube. I can just uh, ignore that, and That's I'm enough, here right? on my own. It works perfectly. Fabulous. Well, right, and that was oh, lovely. There we go. Yeah. So other features, you've got the barometric settings for your altimeter. So the other the other thing you'll notice about the altimeter here is we've again re-engineered the altimeter so it's clearer than ever before. Yep. So what you've got here, we're taking full advantage of the uh, the digital uh, display. So we've got the needle that scrolls round, and as it scrolls round behind the black area here, it's wiping up the next range of numbers. I love that. So you've got an analog gauge. It so gives clever. you a sense of rate of change. Yep. You've got a digital readout of your actual age altitude that makes calling out your, your altitude much easier than ever before. Yep. And then to change your pressure settings again, you can just scroll them up with the IPI and yep. confirm, and it's in there, as simple as that. Similarly with your transponder codes, if you touch transponder down here, it'll bring up the transponder page. Nice. If you push and hold, it'll ident. Oh, nice. Uh, and so if we just put conspicuity in there for the for the UK, excuse me one second, <laughs> ham fingers. 7,000, <laughs> and away we go. And it shows up on the PFD as well. Beautiful. Um, your autopilot functions, again, this will be new to a lot of people that are flying yeah. uh, manual helicopters. Very much so. Uh, fundamentally, to uh, to get the, the, the SAS mode, so the attitude hold function, you just press the autopilot trim button. Okay. And if at any time you want to turn the autopilot off, again, you can see down here that it's indicating that the autopilot's on. Yep. If we want to turn that off, we just Done. click the autopilot off button engage it from the cyclic or from down here. Okay. If you then want to go and engage the higher order mode, so if we talk two axis autopilot to start with, yep. then you can you, hold an altitude. You can hold an altitude. Yep. So if we pop the altitude hold on, the, al the autopilot functions are now on the home page of the IPI. Yep. So you can turn the altitude hold function on, and once you open that up, then you can dial in uh, a new target for it if you want to, or just turn it with the puck. Beautiful. Similarly, with, with heading, it'll capture the heading that you're flying at the point you turn it on. Yep. And then once you open the, the heading page, you can just steer the helicopter with nice. the uh, with the puck. So, so it's you like, just sit there and yeah, yeah play like, around like, like driving a ship. <laughs> much much simpler than before. You've also got options for speed hold, but for a two-axis autopilot, that flips between altitude and speed because it's only controlling the uh, uh, the cyclic. Right. And then obviously with the navigation mo mode, it'll just tell you that it's synced with the uh, the route 
from Beautiful. your uh, from your uh, iPad. Yep. So essentially, that's all of the uh, the major features of the 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 IPI interface. If we look over at the the PFD first, or the MFD for a second, we'll just go back to this guy uh, here. Yeah. So I've got all the the displays on my side. Do you want to take a yeah? We'll take head, head, so headphones off for a second. Yeah. Go back to the. Uh, Sounds Normal good. microphones. So uh, if you look over at the PFD, obviously because you're a qualified pilot, or so I'm told, <laughs> so you can have dual instruments over there to make a... Yeah, uh, but I don't have any flight controls no, over we've here. Taken those out. we've taken those out. Because but it has uh, dual controls. Dual controls. The cyclet's exactly the same as this one. Yep. The collective has got the same head as this one, but the pivot point's a bit further sits back. down so on the side It's more like there. a conventional handbrake. Yep. If we turn the PFD off, you've then got well, your MFD screen. Passenger. So now you're just a passenger. We've got a large traffic scope over there to give you all of the ADS-B traffic information yep. live to that screen. It'll also display down here in the, the HSI. The HSI also gives you your, your wind and your heading bug information. Right. Uh, there are alternate modes here, so you can flip that between camera. Play a little um, cold play in there. You can put your, your music streaming live from your phone yep. uh, or your telephone on there. Uh, one calls. thing I didn't nice. point out, and I've left my phone off stage, but just down here, mm -hmm. there is a, a space that's purposely designed for your, your mobile phone mm -hmm. uh, oh, with nice. a Wi-Fi charger oh, in there nice. as well, charge? so that'll wow. charge, right. charge while you're, you're flying. Amazing. Um, and then in uh, the, other, the other details to look at as well, of course, is we've added the roof panel, and oh, most oh. people won't be that's familiar elegant. with this. So um, up here, what we're trying to do is make sure that the basic flying environment is as simple and as clean as it possibly can be. Yep. So we've put all of the controls up here that you don't use that regularly while you're conducting a normal VFR flight. Yep. So for the wheeled version, you've got your undercarriage switch, so that just pops down like a little uh, undercarriage leg. Yep. The wheel on the end of it has got a twist function on it, so if you twist it, that unlocks the caster lock nice. for the nose wheel. Yep. So very simple, very visual, very intuitive. Yep. Um, the rotor brake is up here, so again, it's another swandle, so you just pop, pull it down, and then once you finish with it, it's out of the way. Out of the way of temptation of <laughs> commercial passengers or kids or whoever you might have in the, the helicopter with you. Totally. And then this, uh, this final uh, control on the center line is your uh, wheels, uh, your brake release. So the, the, the brakes are on by default in yep. this, so it, the wheeled one will land like a skidded helicopter nice. with your held yep. in position. Yep. Um, you pop that down, you'll get a little indicator that shows you that you've released your brakes and that gives you the, the ability to, uh, to taxi. Nice. So all very simple, all very elegant. And the two other controls that we've got up here is you've got your ELT, so uh -huh. the functionality for your ELT, Important, which yep. hopefully you won't need. Uh -huh. yep. uh, and then we've also got the trim tank control. So right. one of the ways that we get uh, the CG range that we need to be able to take 595 kilo passengers, three and a half hours worth of fuel and fly at 140 knots, yep. is we've got a, a slightly more advanced fuel system than you have on similar um, light helicopters. So there's a trim tank in the nose here that behind the scenes just manages where the fuel is to bring the fuel. So uh, we don't need CG. to do anything. You I don't need to be switching anything you up. Don't you don't, you don't touch flight. anything. If there's, a, if there's any problems, then the fuel gauge will warn you. You'll get a warning and you can uh, But you if, can it isolate fails, if it fails, there's no... No, it's it's it. there's some procedures that involve you might yeah. have to jettison or you might have to lock it off so that it keeps the CG mm -hmm. and you'll get a warning that'll tell you how long you've got before you need to land right. uh, before the CG drifts out. So if we talk about warnings for a second... Can then I just stop on a, on a safety point that yeah. was really important, I think, for me when I learned it? The, the trimmer tank is at the very nose of the aircraft, but it's actually not really internal inside the structure of the no. aircraft. It's actually external no, to no, the it's aircraft, right? No, it's designed to be external to the structure. Yeah, yeah. you can't have fuel in the cabin. Exactly. So okay. it's completely separate from the, the cab of the let's, aircraft. Let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about warnings for a second. Okay. So um, this is obviously a very sophisticated cockpit. Looks uh, like it. And it's also important that you've got simple, high-integrity hardware yep. uh, to give the pilot critical warnings. So on the top of the binnacle here, we've got a series of warning lights. Yep. So just the same as what you'd see uh, in, in other similar turbine helicopters. So yep. all of the usual suspects on there. And that is really simple hardware. It's a bulb and a wire yep. connected to a sensor that tells you if something's working or not. Right. Now, in addition to this, if you get one of these lights popping up, then we've engineered what we call uh, emotionally sensitive um, warnings, mm -hmm. yeah, that will not only 
alert you to the fact that something's wrong, but for our less experienced pi people, for, for people that we're drawing into aviation for the first time, yep. we're trying to give them as much support and help as we possibly can. Yeah. Uh, to, or people to, that maybe to, aren't as fresh, right? To have a, yeah, to, on a regular, to, uh, regular basis. Yeah, yeah. To, to make managing that situation as easy as possible. Right. So we call these, uh, you've got a, a warning example there and you've got a, uh, an alert there. Um, and so they will tell you not only that you've got a problem, yep. but what to do. That's in simple, key. concise language, yep. what to do on your flight when that happens. And we, we, uh, we've done that as a, a matter of principle because of the types of pilots that we're, we're expecting to have within the, the pilot population. Yep. Again, across the top, in the spirit of trying to make things as easy as possible to use, mm -hmm. all of the things that you'd otherwise be looking at an app to calculate or trying to work out in your head, <laughs> it's all done for you. So as well as your airspeed, you've got ground speed, so yep. we know how quickly we're actually covering ground. Reference and then you've the got time. a live calculation of range, so how far you can fly based on your current ground speed and your current fuel consumption, yep. and also your endurance, how long at the current rate of consuming fuel yep. you can stay in the air. All of that stuff's done for you to make everything as simple Temperature, uh, and time. as easy as possible. They seem like such little details, but they're so critical to have just at a glance right yeah, there. At right? a glance, everything is yep. easy to find. I love that. This one's got the second comm radio. There's also a marine radio option for, for guys that are, are marinized. Yep. So it's, it's all... Uh, it's all good. Let's have a <laughs> look at the, uh, the rear fuselage. You know what, uh, Jace? Yeah. I've been uh, hearing this back here. My legs are stretched. Yeah. Incredible. The space it has, it's absolutely <laughs> amazing. You've got the best seat in the house, Ruben. <laughs> best seat. You know, I it's hard to get you. Ruben out of that seat because he loves it so <laughs> I much. I love that seat. Yeah. I'm going to have somebody fly me. I love that back seat. You know, it's like flying in first class, uh, Jason, when you're yeah. in the back seat. And I think the middle seat is probably uh, the best of the house. So the whole point of this interior was that we created an environment that was a, a first-class flight for everybody every time you go flying. Yep. So if you, if you pair want to just jump in the back to illustrate the, the point, yep. you might as well do it from yep. that side. Yep. So we've got three 500-millimeter seats. So these are the same size as Range Rover seats. Um, You've got a, per, a, a great view from every seat. So hey, let's bring yeah. the cameraman we've, in. We've elevated, come in. Come on, we've elevated in. The, uh, the rear seat position so that you can space. see past Here. the pilot's head to the center. The, uh, the roof is sufficiently high that even uh, uh, our tallest percentiles can still clear all of the things that they need to. And then just in terms of your seating position, guys, how's the leg room? Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, can, I can almost lay down. Shoulder room. It's incredible, yeah. Yeah, incredible. really good. And we had somebody six foot six in here, and yeah, they still exactly. have headroom. And, and again, just from a cable management and keeping the place tidy point of view, yeah. the headsets fit on the back of the seats, so they can be tied away. The cables run in between the seats, and again, the idea is you bring it up under your arm, over your head, and it's, it's mounted low on the wall, so when you lean forwards, you're not trapping cables uh, or anything else. <laughs> Amazing. There we go. So that's the, that's nice. the, the rear cabin. So let's move on. Oh, the other thing to point out, of course, is we've got uh, USBs everywhere for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, lots as of people charging have, in the helicopter. Uh, as people have asked. We have to. So we've skipped through a lot of this yep. stuff. Let's talk <laughs> about the, uh, the main rotor. Let's go there. So oh, we've talked yeah. a lot about the, uh, the general aerodynamics of the main rotor cowling, the blade roots, and how we get all of this mechanical stuff into a helicopter without killing our, uh, our drag. So um, obviously, Going to a three-bladed rotor system is a lot more complicated than a conventional two-bladed helicopter. Yep. Uh, it means that this stuff up here gets more complicated. It means that the skids and the wheels need dampers and things to deal with ground resonance. It does make the whole helicopter a lot more complicated. So I right. think it's really important for people to understand why yeah, a three-bladed helicopter or a multi-bladed helicopter makes such a difference. So. I've uh, created a simple demonstration here. <sighs> okay. So if you can hold this for me, this is my, this is a what if. This is what HX50 would have been like if it was two bladed. So the thing about two bladed helicopters is they've got a single pin that goes through the, the mast, yep. which means that there's essentially no stiffness in the connection between the main rotor and the fuselage. So the only thing that's holding that fuselage in the correct orientation is its own self-weight. So if you have the tiniest gust, <laughs> it wobbles around like that, okay? So, and that happens. I, I, I felt that, this. That feels uh, I felt pretty scary. This. I think yeah. it, it sounds familiar. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's the Do you the remember a time in Alaska, Ruben, that, yeah. uh, sounds familiar. That, that this was pretty, uh, 
so that's the, that's a fundamental characteristic of two-bladed rotor systems. They're obviously much simpler. They can be a lot cheaper. But fundamentally, you've got to live with the fact you've got no stiffness in the connection between the rotor system, which is essentially a big gyro in space. That the rotor system uh -huh. wants to stay where it is. Right. Uh, but there's nothing other than gravity holding that. I'm helicopter. done with this one. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> if you then go to a three-bladed rotor system, what you find? Let's see. There we go. It's a team effort. Yeah. So it needs three of us this time. So if we pull that nice and tight, so you can see it bobbing around already. Now it's got some stiffness. No matter how I push it, it soon returns to the position that it wants to be. And the reason for that is that the moment you offset the point that the blades are attached from the center of the mast outboard, the centripetal acceleration, or the centrifugal force, as people might know it, is trying to keep that aircraft aligned with the main rotor system. And this is what gives helicopters that have more than two blades the better handling qualities in higher wind conditions. Very nice. So I like that when demonstration. You, when you I'm look looking at forward the, to that. When That's you look nice. at the main rotor system up here, yeah. what you can see here is essentially we've got a, a, a flapping hinge uh, off a flapping hinge, which is up here. Okay. So it's significantly offset from the, the mast. So yep. as that blade flaps, the centripetal acceleration is going to want to try and pull the, uh, the aircraft back into line with the rotor mast. Yep. If you look at the, the rotor system itself, I don't know if you want to pull some of the controls. Yeah. Um, we've opted for a, uh, a system where we use seesaw bars, so jack bars to lift the whole swash assembly up, and then you've got a pitch and a roll bar here that move the, the swash plate around and deliver your cyclic actions up to the, uh, up to the main rotor head. Um, what you can see on the blade cuffs here is the, our blade retention strategy is to use uh, a strap pack. Now, the reason for that, we spent a long time looking at elastomerics. Yep. The reason for using a strap pack is quite simple. If you use an elastomeric, it pushes the flapping hinge out so far to be compatible with that aerodynamic cowling okay. that you end up with a massive donut on the top of the helicopter. So what kind of strap packs are going to be so, in the helicopter when it's in So at the moment, to get the whole hub uh, and the whole gearbox and that assembly uh, developed out, we're using stainless steel ones for development. So there's 20 straps in there. Okay. Uh, that are, so it still gives all the Excuse redundancy. Yeah. In production, we will swap that out for a composite pack so we get okay. better life, better failure modes. What modes. kind of life are we talking so, about? It'll be the same as the aircraft. So it'll be on condition 5,000 5, hours. Oh, nice. they'll, be, they'll be great. This is the um, best part of the helicopter. It's going to make a, uh, this. Is, we call this the, the sort of the soul of the helicopter. Yeah, the soul yeah. of so the helicopter. So all of its characteristics come from what goes on up there. This is, this is what makes it fly like a proper helicopter. Yeah. The other, uh, the other thing it that makes we've done, it safe again, like a proper helicopter. Yeah, the other thing we've done again to, to, to uh, maximize the, the performance and maximize the aerodynamics is you'll notice this, this step that we've created here yep. is so that we can take the, the socket fairing yep. that then feeds into the eyeball because your rotor blade will flap, mm -hmm. so it'll feather, it'll flap, and then it'll lead and lag. Yeah, show so, me how it leads and legs. So the okay. lead lag, the, the flapping and the feathering is done by the, the, uh, the strap packs. Yep. And then the, the leading and lagging actually happens about this point here. Okay. And you've got an integrated lag damper, so a shear lag damper built within the cuff. Nice. And the reason for that is to give it some protection and, of course, again, to keep it out of the, uh, the wind, to minimize the hub drag to yeah. give us that forward flight performance that's so important. And this feels elastomeric to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is a silicon-based rubber with some other yeah. clever stuff in it. Yeah. Um, and then these two pinholes. <laughs> it makes it sound pretty here, simple. These, these two pinholes here, these are your blade retention pins. And that is essentially how you do your blade folding. So you pop those two wings up pop one of the pins out, Simple. and the blade. Very so fast. You, align, you align one blade at the back, and you pop the pins out and swing the other two back, back with it. Nice. Yeah. So okay. that, uh, that's essentially the main, the main rotor transmission. Obviously, this is sat on our uh, main rotor so that's the main rotor hub. It's sat on our main rotor transmission. Um, this is a, a fully assembled main rotor transmission. So we've got a, about five and a half, six thousand RPM coming in from the engine speed reduction gearbox. Okay. Now you'll notice that we've got this angled input. Now the reason for that again is all about system level performance. Yep. So the idea is we create the bathtub. You've all seen the bathtub in the composite shells we've shown before. Yep. The engine doesn't sit in that thing at the top. The engine sits much lower. So if you open the, the baggage bay, the, uh, this bathtub that you've got here yep. uh, is where the, where the engine lives. So, so it's nice and low yeah, down it's there. It's nice and low. It's out of the wind. 
Um, and oh, it brings the, the sea of G down quite a bit too, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's all good. Um, and you can get a sneak peek of just how voluminous that baggage bay is from in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, we've got the angled input to give us that. We've got a first stage spiral bevel reduction and then an epicyclic reduction stage to get us down to 410 horsepower, uh, sorry, 410 RPM at the top of the main rotor. Very similar to, to other helicopters in this, uh, this size category. Nice. Um, and what's really important about all of this is traditionally these components would have been astronomically expensive. Right. And this really talks to uh, the, our vertical integration strategy, the pain that we've been going through over the last couple of years, developing the processes to make gears, to make bearings, to make flight critical components, so that I have end-to-end -end control of the cost of making all of these flight critical elements. Yeah. We can do that now. We're demonstrating that here today, that we've got it with these processes. We can make these parts to the price we say we can. And that's Incredible. what's powering this uh, sort of renaissance in general aviation that we're Not just we're you can, but you have. Well, there it is. That's incredible. There it is. One other little point before we go over and talk about the engine for a second yeah. is how the, the gearbox mounts to the engine. So again, it's fairly conventional for this class of, of aircraft. Yeah. You've got two big lobes on the, the edge of the gearbox. That reacts the main rotor torque. Yeah. And in the other directions, those things float. Okay, yep. and then we have these four tie bars. At the moment, we're engineering those as just solid links. Yep. Uh, as we go through development, if we find that we've got, uh, we haven't quite got the vibration where we want it, we have the opportunity to put inertial dampers at the uh, the top, and then we also have the uh, uh, the option to turn these into passive struts as well, right, so just to, to, to further reduce the amount of vibration that's transferred. Uh, down to the aircraft. So right. that's the, uh, the HX50 hub. Again, I describe it as a, a greatest hits album. It's mm -hmm. all the best proven ideas vertically integrated by us and then packaged with a little bit of panache. <laughs> right, let's go and have a look at the engine, engine. for a second. Oh, this is, a, this is an exciting moment. So again, over the course of the, uh, the last two, three years, you've been watching us develop the configuration of the, the engine, uh, develop all of the, the processes that you need to be able to make a gas turbine engine. Uh, and this is essentially a culmination uh, of our manufacturing capability for producing a cost-effective gas turbine engine. So unconventionally, we have a direct drive starter generator on the front of the engine. This essentially reduces the need for the biscuit box gearbox you have on the front of the engine. It makes the engine a lot simpler. Um, it creates some of the problems in terms of power electronics, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're dealing with that. Um, and so we've got a very compact, very lightweight um, starter generator on the front of the engine. What you can see then is you're straight into a pressure ratio of seven, high grade aerospace titanium impeller. Uh, this pushes the air through and up into your veined diffuser through a series of turning vanes. And then this section inside the engine here, the compressed air bleeds around the combustor comes into the annular combustor. We have 12 fuel nozzles around the annular combustor that gives a, give us great atomization, right. great performance, great per, uh, combustion efficiency. That's going to help um, get rid of all the, uh, the exhaust th that's on your one, tailbone, That's right? one of the things that contributes to it, yeah. yeah. And then you can see the spray, the spray nozzles just inside there as well. Um, the flow then goosenecks around through the uh, high pressure turbine or the gas generator turbine. And this front end of the engine here is essentially your, your N1, okay? This. We then have a, an interduct here that's missing from this because it's a, a stand. You've got a first stage nozzle, and then this is your power turbine. So it's this component here that essentially delivers the 500 horsepower to drive the main and tail rotor systems. No. That drives backwards into a speed reduction gearbox down here. The speed reduction gearbox drop, drops the 35,000 RPM <laughs> down to around 6,000 RPM. Uh, we've got a lay shaft configuration. You have to have a shaft anyway because you've got to send drive back to the tail rotor. And we're in the, we'd, we'd just repositioned the sprag clutch and the rotor brake back here uh, to get them away from the input seals up to the main rotor gearbox to prevent oil leaks and other problems that Also to make happen. it a little easier for those engineers, right? Yeah, it also means that those parts that, that can cause issues in service are easy to access as well. Right. So sprag clutch and rotor brake back there. Forwards along a, a lightweight shaft, we've got a um, torque sensor here, which is essentially a, a tube distortion torque sensor. 
final bevel set to get us round the corner and up into the main rotor gearbox. And then this is your main rotor input drive shaft that goes now, into Jason, the, the main the rotor Jason, the big, gearbox. big question is, when is this thing going to start making noise? Well, that's a good question. And come this way and have a look at my rocket. All right. So what we've got I, I've, here. I've been wondering, I, I thought, I, are we building rockets or helicopters, yeah. Jason? <laughs> so this is, our, this is the first section of the engine to be, to be tested. So this is the combustion test rig. So this so is this middle part this here, right? This is essentially mm -hmm. this part of the engine here. So this test essentially proves that we can get the fuel into the engine, we can atomize the engine, we can start the AE engine, we can get stable combustion, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that gives us the basis then to do the gas generator test. So when we're talking when, about familiar noises, yeah. what part of the noise is this? We got the boom. Yeah. That's the spool so up. When that's you put the fuel, right? you're the spool up. When you put the fuel in and it goes boof, yeah. that's your combustor. That's, so that's going to do the, the, whi the whining noise is the uh, the starter generator winding the the N1 rotor. Okay. That could, that's going to do boof. Yeah, that's what that's this the will boof. do. So on the front of this system here. Uh, we're obviously metering controlled pressurized air into the combustion system, yep. introducing the fuel and making a fire. This is a Venturi mass flow meter. Okay. So this controls the, uh, the mass flow that's going into the system. Inside here, we've got the combustion uh, casing. Right. So uh, I, I mentioned to you guys earlier, we've made all of these rings. So we've developed the processes to develop the, the sheet metal rings in super alloy. Uh, we've been trying to spin the, let me just show you these two components here. On the front of the combustion casing, the, the end bit here and the front bit there. Yep. We've been trying to spin those because it's a very neat way of doing it. We're going to have to press them. So the guys are making us some press tools at the moment to make those a little bit more efficiently. As yep. soon as we've done that, we'll be in a position to, to get that doing, uh, to get that uh, burning. So as soon as we get this show out of the way, that's our top priority. Get this one making fire. So on Monday? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't stand there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jace, I, I'm listening to you just kind of rattle through what has been made here. And I think the gravity of what is in front of us needs to set in for just a second. Because not only have you guys designed an engine, but you've actually built it as well. So full vertical integration, top to bottom, every one of these components you guys have built. Well, if I, if, I, if I walk you through what's involved in doing this, the, the, the problem with jet engines and making cost-effective jet engines isn't about making really clever shapes like this <laughs> and doing really clever turbo machine. It's not about that. It's about the fact that traditionally the only people that you could go to to get those bits would charge you an arm and a leg. Right. So the, the trick to doing this is getting yourself into a position where you can make these parts. Yep. And so what we've done and what this demonstrates uh, is that starter generator. We can make all of the parts we need to to get the engine started. Yeah. When it comes to machining precision, highly balanced rotors that run at approaching 50,000 RPM out of the finest grades of aerospace titanium, we can do that within our factory at Hill. Yeah. And then when it comes to precision labyrinth seals and curvic couplings, all the things that make the heart of the engine work, we can do that at Hill now. Yeah. And when it comes to uh, forged and machined uh, turbine discs, we can do that at Hill now. Cast turbine blades, we've just proven out our processing uh, processes for casting mm -hmm. uh, turbine blades out of super alloy materials, first generation super alloy materials um, that allow us to make these blades at a completely unprecedented price point. We do the same for the, tur the power turbine, it's the same, just bigger. And then you've watched us over the course of the last year, 18 months, yep. develop all of the processes we need to make aerospace grade uh, gears Gears. to the tolerances you need at the right price point. This isn't about the science and the engineering. This is all about the manufacturing. And what's really important in this whole venture is that aerospace companies need to be manufacturing companies. Yeah. Okay? We can't be a technology company and then push the manufacturing out to a third party because yeah. you just lose control of your price point. You lose everything. So what this demonstrates is we can make that engine to that point. What this will start to generate over the coming weeks is that we can make the Bernie bits burn. <laughs> and then as soon as we've done that, that gas generator assembly will go into an expanded version of this test rig. We'll get the first half of the engine running. And then we add the power turbine, the transmissions, and build that out step by step. Now, how, how do we know this is going to be safe? How do we know it's a brand new engine? How do we know it's going to be a safe engine? So it's the, it's the same. It's the same. Well, there's a number of reasons, but it's the same as everything else that we've done on the project. This isn't a brand new engine. This is an engine that is a, uh, a, a compendium 
you know, a, 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 an assembly of all of the best ideas, all of the things that have been proven in service on lots and lots of different engines over 70 years yeah. that work really well. And we've done a good job of bringing those components together, vertically integrating the manufacturing, and then using the latest certification standards, the latest manufacturing methods, uh, and the latest quality control and non-destructive testing methods to make sure that what we've got is what we need to make a reliable engine. Right. And don't forget that um, you don't just wake up one morning and decide that you're going to design a jet engine. <laughs> so if the, the guys come and talk to our team members over the course of today and tomorrow, yeah. you'll find that we've got guys with huge amounts of experience at making jet engines for aerospace applications, biz jet applications, industrial engines over many, many decades. Right. I won't reveal the age of some of the people that went back <laughs> for it, uh, but there's but it's a lot of experience. There's a lot of gray team. hair on the team. <laughs> More after yeah. the last couple of months. Yeah, especially um, after the last couple of months. So yeah, that, that's GT50. That's the heart of uh, of the HX50 aircraft. So we've got so the heart. We've got you've the got heart. You've got the soul. And you've got the panache. We've got the mind. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So let's talk. Uh, back to the slides for a second. Um, let's talk uh, about exciting things. Mm. So uh, we'll briefly just uh, recap on sales. I mean, you can see by the amount of seats that we've had to bring in that uh, sales have continued to be strong. Who knew that having too many customers would be a problem? <laughs> um, we're now up to 973 aircraft. We sold. It's amazing. Woo! Thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Amazing. We've sold 789 uh, HX50s and 184 HC50s, uh, and that's, is it still 69 countries? No, that's outdated, 186 seats. 186 yes, countries, 186. very good. Yeah, so we generated a truly global uh, community. And of course, that creates another problem for, for us as a company in that we need to build all these machines, we need a massive factory. Mm. You will have watched us over the course of the, the last 18 months or so uh, seek planning permission uh, for a site local to our existing operation. And for a lot of reasons, that has proved quite problematic. Um, we uh, opted for an off-airport site because it off offered cost-effective land. It was a brownfield site that should offer easy planning permission for manufacturing. But as I'm sure many of you in the audience will have, will have experienced with building your own hangars at home, getting people to agree to the flying part of that is just problematic. Yeah. Uh, and so we fought that for as long as we can. Um, and it was time really to change direction, to get control of that before it became something that was going to dominate timescales on the program. Mm -hmm. So we've now adopted a, a dual site approach. Okay. What we uh, are doing for production is we are going to manufacture in one location and then fly from another location and just ship the machines for two and then expand our flying location at a later date into something that can, can suit all things. So with immediate effect, we'll be expanding our, our rented uh, space. We've viewed a number of buildings that will allow us to... Uh, grow into, I think on some of the updates I've mentioned that Mark, bless him, has ordered a machine uh, to do more CNC work, more pattern making that's bigger it's than any big of machine, our factories. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've got to find a factory to put that into in <laughs> January. Um, this allows us to complete the development and get into production without planning permission issues. Uh, there's good stock available immediately around our current facilities, so there's no challenges to the wonderful team that we've, we've put together. Uh, it's not going to put anybody out in that sense. Yeah. Uh, and we're just at the moment finessing the size of what that needs to be before uh, we can move on. I can also announce today uh, that in terms of our new home for flight ops, uh, on Tuesday, I think it was, yeah. we signed heads of terms with Halfpenny Green Airport Woo. Uh, to, yeah. to, to, to purchase... Uh, to lease and then to purchase 10 acres of developed land. Uh, Hapney Green Airport, being an airport, benefits from permitted development rights. So what that means is for anything to do with flying, so hangarage, flight ops, flight training, uh, we can essentially serve 28, no 28 days notice and then start building whatever we need there. Uh, and so Amazing. I'd like to thank Tony Hall, who's the uh, new owner of uh, Hapney uh, Green Airport, for a very expeditious He's here, right? Meeting. He is here, He's he's here, here tonight. tonight. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, and the beauty of Hapney Green in particular is the site uh, is within policy. 
for planning policy for aviation manufacturing. So over the years, we can expand our operations there without the pressure that we're feeling at the moment from getting uh, a political entity to do what we need them to do. The development so, here will not hold any production, correct? No, no not That's at all. clear. So flight ops can happen immediately. Yep. Uh, and we go to a bigger rented unit for production, is, for development and production. It takes perfect, away yeah. all of the problems. You have a so. dual role model for the HX50 and the HC50, and now we've got a dual role model for manufacturing. You know me, perfect. I like to keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, GV toll. GV toll, so, you mean EV, EV toll? I right? absolutely do not. There's mean a typo on there, EV I think, toll. Yeah. So no? GV toll is our strategy for, uh, it's an end-to-end -end strategy for a sustainable future for the helicopter industry. The industry is not under attack, but facing really challenging times ahead with what appears to be the relentless march of electric aircraft and new configurations. Uh, and, and quite rightly, people are ask, asking questions about well, what is the future of a, a helicopter? Right. Yeah, a lot of people ask Well, you that. can tell it, you can, you can take it from me that uh, the only thing that can get off the ground more efficiently vertically than a helicopter is a balloon, mm. right? <laughs> and if you make a helicopter that's streamlined and efficient, they fly very fast as well. And so the helicopter has a very bright future. Right. But what's important is that we're able to design helicopters not just for our existing uh, private operator base, but for the commercial base that will make operating helicopters profitable again. And our GVTOL strategy has got two prongs to it, essentially. It's how we meet the requirements of a world that's ever more interested in sustainability and making sure that we can demonstrate carbon neutrality going into the future. Uh, but it also is going to put helicopter operators back on a paying basis again. Okay? What does G stand for? The G stands for green. Green. Yeah. Green. Right. Green vertical takeoff and lift. How is that possible? Well, let's go over there and I'll tell you a little bit about it. But before I do, let me just make this point. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I feel has been overlooked by a lot of the new platforms is just how difficult general aviation is as a business. Uh, the thing about general aviation is a lot of the things that you end up doing in GA are VFR. Right. right. So you're constantly hampered by the weather. The missions are very flexible. You have a terrible paid employee to passenger ratio because you've got one pilot and a little aircraft like this. Yep. So the costs will always appear high to the paying, uh, the paying customer. Yep. So you're, you're hamstrung by your, your sort of fixed operating costs and your low utilization. So the total cost of ownership and operating the aircraft is really, really, really important. Right. And so to make GA pay again, what we need to do is deliver a platform that's got low and predictable costs, high performance, so you can do what you need to do, yep. high mission flexibility, so we can trade off fuel for payload, yep. kind of difficult with a load of batteries in the back, yep. uh, and we can, uh, we can do a multiple range of uh, missions with the aircraft, because the helicopter is fundamentally really flexible, exactly. particularly if you design a good one. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> and so our strategy is all about how we make the helicopter more sustainable in, in a world that will have to wait a little while for batteries to be good enough to make an electric helicopter or some of the other configurations truly economically viable in a business that's tough as it is. Right. Okay? Yeah. So these essentially are the, three, are the five pillars of what our uh, GVTOL strategy is all about. Like the that. first one is sustainable aviation fuel. What does that mean? So let's go over here, and I'll just introduce this idea for people that are not familiar with it. So the, the, running, the running joke here, <laughs> I've got some lights over here. The running joke here is that uh, there are two greens in sustainable, OK? Yeah. There's, there's all of the work to make us more carbon neutral, more environmentally responsible. But in any business, there's another kind of green that you have to look after, OK? Uh, if you don't look after the commercial aspects of business, it's not going to work. And if you're trying to roll a new product out, it has to be better than the old ones from an economic perspective. So our GVTOL strategy is really about delivering a more sustainable uh, general aviation while making sure that we give operators the best opportunity to be profitable that we possibly can. So we came over here to talk about sustainable aviation so new fuel. fuel. 
Yeah. So there's a, big, there's a big move is in... Is this decorations or is this important no, no. stuff that we want to know about? This, this, this is good. You'll like this. <laughs> um, so we, we all know about sustainable aviation fuel. It's a blend of uh, bio-sourced fuels and oils that have been reprocessed into a fuel that uh, can be blended with conventional jet fuel. Okay? Sure. That's Sounds great. Complicated. Um, the way to think of biofuel is essentially like Mother Earth's battery. Okay? okay. So every, every year, every day, plants grow. Mm -hmm. As they grow, they consume carbon dioxide. They scrub the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. But then, whether it's farmed crops or whether it's other crops, they rot in the fields and they release their carbon back again. Okay. With biofuels, what we're doing is we're essentially interrupting the process between plants growing and cleaning the atmosphere mm -hmm. and plants rotting and releasing it back. We've okay. essentially created... Mother Earth's battery, <laughs> okay? And what we do with this is we take the, the biomass and there are some fantastic new processes. There are people in this room here today that are developing uh, cellulose-based biofuels that can use 100% of that plant to create 100% carbon-neutral biofuel. So you're now, telling me this is available on the market today? People could buy this stuff today? Uh, sustainable aviation fuel is on the market today yep. and the, the, process, the specific process I'm talking about is developed and, and working at the moment. Wow. So what we've got here is a route to delivering carbon neutral fuel, but getting all of the best of what today's helicopter technology can deliver uh, from a commercial perspective. So from day one, that engine is going to be ready for this fuel. Exactly. So our engine will be the first engine certified from the ground up to run on 100% carbon neutral biofuel. You'll be able to put biofuel into your aircraft. And the beauty of having a closed community of customers like we've got mm -hmm. is that if you were to poll our customers, and I have, <laughs> you'd find that 66% of them uh, have their fuel delivered home. Uh -huh. So while uh, large-scale biofuel production isn't going to work for big commercial jets and things because it just requires too much space. But for our customer base... We have a very small community. Yeah, we have right. a very small community. GA is a very small community. And we're community. working with partners to have that capability. We have, the, pe we have that the people fuel. that have the land. We have the right. people that have the technology. And we all want to be more environmentally responsible. This is the way to simultaneously make general aviation pay, have high performance, flexible aircraft, and being completely environmentally responsible now. It's a pragmatic way to deliver carbon neutrality, so rather than operating in the hope that batteries will be good enough in time to have so a real once impact. we're in production, this will scale up to have on-demand fuel for our customers. Exactly. That's a plan. Exactly. Good. So this is, this is GVTOL, ladies and wow. gentlemen. Wow, incredible. We have my click. <laughs> OK, so GVTOL, as I've said, two prongs, make it green and look after the green. So how do we allow our customers to be more profitable than ever before? Well, the first thing we've talked about a little bit already, vertical integration. Everything you see here, we make. So we have end-to-end -end control of the purchase cost of the aircraft, end-to-end -end control of spares, and that also gives us the ability to drive the cost of insurance down to unprecedented levels. So we're working with three different insurance partners at the moment to provide a global coverage for Hill Insurance, where we will partially underwrite the values of these hulls to get the cost of your insurance down. This the is reason, exciting stuff, Jason. The reason why that's important is because, as I've said, these sorts of aircraft have low utilization. It's the fixed costs that dominate. It's your depreciation. We've taken care of that. 5,000 hours on condition. Yeah. Uh, it's your insurance. We're taking care of that. By the way, the insurance, we just had a very important conversation with a major player, yeah. and something is brewing and coming up very soon. I can't right? tell you how excited they are. I'm aware, Ruben. I'm the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> you, know what, you know what's amazing, though, is you know, when you talk to your, uh, the customers and you know, as operators as well, one of the, the most crippling costs right now that's been skyrocketing is insurance. Yeah. And everybody's talking about how hard it is to, to get insurance yeah. and how expensive it is. And so having that conversation that we had recently with one of the biggest insurance companies in the world yeah. um, and seeing the excitement and enthusiasm for this project was incredible. Yeah. Well, and again, you've got to ask yourself, why is insurance so high? Right. And the reason that's driving that is the fact that the machines that are out there at the moment are so expensive to replace, to repair. For commercial operators, getting parts means their machines will be on the ground 
for unacceptable lengths of time. It's crippling on every avenue. Yep. So with, a, with a, a company like us that makes everything, we carry the stock of parts, we support the customer as well. That's, all of these things come together to, to, to create a, a... So you can essentially, you can bring that hull cost down for insurance because you build everything. It, yes. doesn't, it doesn't cost you full price to, to replace well, this there's helicopter. Two, there's two reasons, yeah. Because we build everything, I, I know what it costs to, to make one of these. <laughs> I don't need to insure the list price. I can insure what it costs to make yep. plus a margin. Yep. Okay? Uh, so that, that's a unique advantage to Hill. There isn't yeah. anybody else in the industry that can do that because they don't make the stuff themselves. Right. Okay? Um, the next thing, of course, is the world-class support. When these machines go to work yep. uh, and when our private machines go out to play, we need to make sure that our, co our community is properly supported and again, an engineer driving an engineering company means we're going to carry stock. It means we're going to have parts so that we can get it out to the world. So if I have a part that breaks, how long do you think it's going to take me to, to get it over to Canada? Uh, for, for consumable parts, so for yeah. things that get worn, worn out, we'll carry those in stock anyway. Yeah. And then it just comes down to dispatch the same day and, and out. So AOG, uh, exactly. overnighted, a couple days, exactly. we've got it. New engine? Yeah, well, we'll carry that because, we're, again, there's more stuff to be released on that over the course of next year. Yep. Major modules, particularly for the early aircraft, will be there on the shelf, so we'll swap it out because if you're having problems with things like the engine and the gearbox, we need to know exactly what's going on. That's uh, the, the easiest and cleanest way to do that is to swap the module. And again, we can do that because the labor is going to cost more than the parts in many requests, uh, exactly. in many, many cases. Let's just briefly touch on aircraft finance. Yep. Uh, at the moment, we've, 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 tar we've uh, targeted and worked with private owners, because those are the people that can mobilize an effort like this. As we move out to a broader, uh, a broader church of people that we're trying to bring back into aviation, we've got to make the barrier to entry as low as possible. So we're actively working with partners at the moment to support the early finance of these aircraft for customers. Yeah. So financing them along the lines of our existing payment terms and also more traditional aircraft finance uh, as we get into pr production. So expect some more announcements on that in the new year. But GVTOL, this is our end-to-end -end strategy to make helicopters pay again. Oh, nice. Woo. Woo. HC50. You'll find that that was a remarkable segue into the next section. <laughs> right. So our view of the future of the light commercial helicopter industry is that our HC series has a lot to contribute. So today, we're formally launching the, uh, the HC50R certified commercial version uh, to, the, to the general public. So Woo. Ruben, Misha, wow. all right. we'd like to... Today, uh, it's available. We're making available today for the first time that anybody can order the HC50 directly without ordering X. Now, Ruben, and what's the list actually, price for an HC50? You know, the HC50 is being launched today. So a pre-order now, the price is 725,000 pounds. Is it, Misha? 725,000 is usually the price, yeah. All right. I would say uh, if you bought it on any other day. So some be clients price. have been benefiting with uh, substantial rewards of actually coming early. This started uh, with the HX50, didn't it? That's right. We had the and Friends of the Founder program. We you know, back in August programs. 2020, how many people on this audience actually remember that you ordered aircraft in 2000? Actually, remember, no, you did actually order in 2020. How many have Put you Put your here? hands up if you ordered in 2020. Woo, those were really courageous. <laughs> now it's here. Hey, All it's right. Brave ones. Okay, 2020. How many of you have ordered in 2021? Woo! Oh, nice. Okay. How many of you have ordered in 2022? Woo! All right. So good group. And this year. Come on. There you go. Yeah. All right. Woo! Everybody in this group is incredible. Yeah. Now, the first ones, Misha, the first ones. They took the, the biggest risk. They took a big risk. They right? got pretty rewarded. That too. was uh, That was quite rewarding because you had some drawings to show. <laughs> and <laughs> some nice renders. And people didn't actually, some of them didn't believe this was going to happen. Yeah. And now, today, we're here, right? And that, that was a big reward for the HX50 clients. Yeah. Now, we're doing something interesting for the launch of the HC50. However, tangible stuff here. 
Absolutely. So what we have, Nisha? Yeah, so if you're going to be wanting to get an HD50, it's available to purchase now. And if you're going to be buying it at the show, we're calling it the show price, um, and actually until Monday, so midnight this coming Monday, you're going to actually be able to get it for $625,000. All right, So there's a substantial discount there. Woo! That's the launch price for the HD50 worldwide. And uh, anybody can and order Wait a second, Ruben. So you're saying I could order an HD50 right now? Yeah. You can order how right would now. I, How would I do that? Okay. It's very simple. For the ones that are on here on the audience, you have your QR code. Just scan the QR code, and you have the option available. Okay? This, this took a while for However, people to get the badge. It was very important for them to have that badge, That's right. right. That's right. The, the badge is important. You have access to privileged pricing of the HC50 order that can happen today. However, if you are an HC50 client, what's going to happen, Misha? If you're an HC50 client, you're going to be able to get special Extra special, special so conditions. So we are freezing the price of the 575 that has been available for the last two years until Monday. Okay, Monday midnight. This price for anybody that has ordered at least one H650. They have privileged conditions to order a number of C's still available for the price of 575 until midnight Monday. Then this price is gone for ever, ever closed. Okay. Yeah, so let's go over this again. If I'm a client, an HX50 client, yes. and I buy sometime between now and Monday, I can get it for $575? That's right. What so if I don't own an HX50? Actually, there are several commercial operators that order a next version, which is a private version, mm -hmm. to have access to the program. We allow yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, some of them have a benefit in a big time. Yeah. I remember oh some cases of uh, four, five, six, ten. And if a, a client has ordered 15 positions. So exactly. you can order a never sees with at least one SC50 uh, position. Now, this is valid for here and also for everybody who's following us online. If you're online, you can order the aircraft until end of Monday at this, this price. After that, gone forever, correct? Did we explain how they, how they buy it? Yes. They have, they have a QR code. So if you guys look at your guys' badges, there's a QR code on there. And if you scan that QR code with your phone, it'll take you to a special web page. Now, if uh, you're pre-registered, it's already going to have your details filled in in there. So you're going to have a look through that, what the current conditions are. And then uh, if you want to add your different details, you can do that in there as well. So you can actually, on your phone, you can go and review what the current terms are. Anytime until uh, midnight uh, Monday. Yeah. Now, if you just want to order straight the HC50, the price, special price of launch 000. is 625 And after... Midnight, Monday, it is gone forever. The right? price is going to increase. All right. Very and good. Right. So we have one really important thing left to do. So I'm going to talk to you ever oh, so Oh, by slightly. the way, sorry, Jason. You remind me. Wait a second. Some people here that have not ordered an SC50 at all. Oh, this is important. <laughs> we forgot that one. <laughs> so right now, the price of the SC50 is at 536. 536,000 pounds. That was the last price. It's been increasing every four CO numbers and has been going fast. This price reaching... is 595, right? Right. The list price is 595. Right now we had 536. If, if I was exactly. a friend of the founder, okay. what price did I get it at? That was 295. <laughs> and then after 395, and then and it continued to progress as we also progressed on the build of this aircraft and also progressing on those serial numbers. So right now we're doing the same thing. Yeah. We're going to be freezing the price of the 536,000 for the AC50 until midnight Monday, UK time, okay? So anybody that is following us online, yep. have uh, gone through a presentation, they wanted to see this happening, <laughs> now is your moment until Monday, Monday, and that price will be also gone. The HC50 is clear and also the HC50. So go ahead, me, uh, Jason. That right. is important. Uh, now onto something even more important. So you've waited for a long time to come and experience these helicopters, and I've got one little job left to do before I let you come and play. So uh, I think I'm going to put some music on again for us. And could I invite all of the Hill team to come and join us on stage, please? Woo! Ladies and Hill gentlemen, team. will you please put your hands on, together guys. for the men and this women of Hill Helicopters come on, that are working day and night right to make middle, your guys. dreams come reality. On. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Incredible. Awesome. Yeah, amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you all. Incredible, guys. Amazing. Cheers, Brian. Very good. Cheers.
Tim. Come stand in the middle. Incredible, you guys. Fab. Great job, <laughs> I know sometimes we make it look easy, but it takes a lot of people to make these helicopters work. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to our own staff. Thank you to our subcontractors. Thank you to our amazing marketing team. Thank you to everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Ruben and Misha, I guess you're going to explain how you want people to come and Absolutely. have a so, look at the helicopters. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. And thank you. Amazing. Give it a hand! Yeah. Jason, look at this incredible team that you've put together here. This is absolutely amazing to see the team that we have. Um, they're going to be available for you guys as well. So they're going to start coming off the stage now um, and going to different stations. They're going to be available for you guys to talk to if you want to. Um, I know you have lots of itching questions that you'd like to ask them. So.